So welcome everyone to our seaweed series meeting. I think I might have accidentally uh, joined and then left and then Teams is not my forte, so we're all still learning here, but thank you guys for joining today. Um, so a few things to go over first, as always, before we get started with our guest. But uh, today I'm joining you from the traditional territories of the Wiwikai, Wiwikum and Kuiaka First Nations, where we are fortunate to live, work and play. Uh, Ali has recently just been out in the field and had a great time with a couple of our students in those territories as well. So um, yeah, they had a had a really good trip up to Lockborough. So uh, thank you for letting us yeah, live, work and play here. It's a great time. Uh, oh, I also need to thank NSERC for uh, helping fund this seaweed series. Uh, and they provided some funds for us to do this. So uh, thank you, NSERC. Uh, today, we are recording this seaweed series seminar. So you will find the past two recordings online and you can find them on the Cardi projects page. And it is under the seaweed series little banner there. So it's pretty easy to find. Um, Another couple of things that we have going on today, because we're always adding something to our meetings, making them a little more complex every time, adding a little more fun. Um, so we have a couple of polls over here in the chat. Hopefully I'm pointing in the right direction. Looks like it to me. But in the chat to the side there, there are a couple of polls there. So the first one is, how did you hear about the Cardi Seaweed Seminar? Was it through email, social media? Did someone just tell you about it? Did someone share the meeting invite with you and tell you to join? Um, I don't know. So throw an answer in there. You should just be able to type it in. Beneath that, there is another poll. Um, make some suggestions of who you might like to hear um, in future seaweed seminars. So. Um, if there's anyone or anything that you'd like to hear about, uh, write it down. I'll take note of it and we'll see if we can make it happen. Um, but today we are joined by Dr. Karen Philby Dexter, who uh, is over at the University of Western Australia and I believe is from Nova Scotia. Did some schooling in Canada. So, you know, pretty cool, pretty cool uh, explorer. Um, and she's going to present to us about uh, blue carbon for kelp restoration and aquaculture. So uh, we're going to pass it over to her and I'm going to spotlight you. And uh, yeah, please go ahead, share, uh, share away. Thanks, Logan. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for having me. So I'm, yeah, I'm from Nova Scotia. I did my PhD on kelp forest at Dalhousie University. Uh, then I popped over to Norway and I've been, uh, I studied kelp in Norway for two years and I, I still actually work in Norway at the sort of equivalent of DFO over there. Um, I also did a uh, NSERC postdoc at Laval University studying uh, Canada's Arctic kelp forest and how they're cycling carbon. And then I'm here uh, in my foot in the door in University of Western Australia. So I'm, I'm bouncing around a bit, um, but I'm still doing a lot of research in Canada. So it's really nice to, to talk today about some of the, the work in Canada that I've been involved in, but also some of the global work on CV blue carbon. Um, my background is mostly on, on kelp forests, um, so, so natural ecosystems, not as much seaweed farming. Um, so I'm mostly coming at this from a restoration and a and a kelp forest uh, angle, but I know that there's a lot of seaweed farmers in the audience, and it's quite transferable what I'm talking about to coastal seaweed farms. Um, and I have a few uh, uh, slides that sort of show that comparison and some of the specific details we need to think about with seaweed farming for blue carbon. All right, get into it. 
Um, so first off, I guess there's a massive push right now to find these sort of carbon dioxide removal strategies to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. And I think if you ask a lay person, they would say, well, yeah, we need to plant trees. Like most of the uh, major policy decisions, most of the major actions to take carbon out of the atmosphere right now at this moment are focused on land, um, primarily like uh, replanting forests, but now um, going into what we call blue carbon habitats. But that's also being done um, from a land-based approach. So replanting mangroves isn't that dissimilar to replanting forests. Um, but actually most of our, the carbon that's stored and sequestered out of the atmosphere is happening in the ocean. Um, so we're definitely underutilizing marine carbon storage uh, solutions and, um, and focusing like much more on you know, planting forests or restoring things in the coastal zone. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, seaweed blue carbon. So this kelp forest on the right, uh, which is from Norway. Um, and to, to date, these are not verified uh, blue carbon habitats. Um, and that's because, which I'll get into in a second, they don't have soil, they don't work the same as forests on land, but there's really good reasons why we should be thinking about them. Um, so first off, the main mechanism for long-term storage of CO2 is the flux of organic carbon from surface waters into the deep ocean. Uh, so we call this the biological pump. Uh, you might've heard of uh, this before. So essentially you have uh, phytoplankton on the surface and this sort of phytoplankton zooplankton community is immensely productive. It's taking in a ton of CO2 from the surface waters, which are exchanging with the atmosphere, um, trapping that in organic material. And then a portion of that organic material is sinking into the deep ocean or becoming buried in deep sediments. This is the main way that we're taking carbon out of our atmosphere. Um, uh, a more minor way that's happening, and this is the main one that sort of um, carbon mitigation strategies have focused on, uh, is burial on land in soil. Um, so this is how terrestrial forests and the sort of established blue carbon habitats are functioning. So um, they would have some sort of above ground uh, biomass, which is storing carbon, and then they're gonna be storing uh, carbon in their sediments that they're growing in. So. <laughs> Christine, do you have a question? Well, maybe not. Anyway, I'll keep going. But if you have a question, feel free to pop in. Um, so seaweed are functioning sim much more similar to plankton. So they grow on rocks um, or if they're farmed, they grow in the water column. Um, they're not burying roots in marine sediments, so they don't really fall into this definition of uh, blue carbon habitats, which has sort of been snuck in under the guise of all of the uh, global policy around terrestrial, for terrestrial forests. Um, but just like plankton, um, there's potential for seaweed particles to um, sequester carbon out of the surface waters and into these deeper um, ocean sinks. Uh, so I think it's really important that we sort of have this framing when we talk about seaweed carbon. Um, and we really shouldn't overlook <laughs> um, our seaweed forests. So they are the most ex extensive uh, biogenic habitat uh, or coastal vegetated habitat in the world. So they're much more extensive than our for than uh, mangroves and seagrass and salt marshes. They're covering um, 25 to 30 percent of the world's coastlines and the best estimates of their total area is about 1.5 to 2 million square kilometers. Um, this is the this map shows the distribution of kelp forests around the world. Um, and I've just kind of popped the main genera on the left and so shown some pictures of what these ecosystems look like. Um, so they're quite diverse depending on where you are, but they're all dominated by large brown seaweeds that are forming uh, the foundation of the ecosystem. Um, and then, of course, they're providing three-dimensional habitat, and there's a lot of biodiversity and co-benefits in the system. Um, and globally, we sort of, um, if you wanted to compare kelp forests in blue to the forests on land, they're, they're not covering as much area as forests on land, but still a considerable amount of area, um, considering they're on a short band of coastline. 
So these ecosystems are really productive. Um, so often we would measure productivity in terms of net primary productivity. So this is after the kelp has respired, um, like what is the sort of net amount of carbon that the kelp is taking in, um, in this case, in terms of meter squared of forest per year. Um, so um, the, this uh, uh, average NPP is broken down across different types of seaweeds. And you can see that the, the sort of uh, orange uh, brown, subtitle brown algae uh, are and the intertidal algae, so this would be like your Ascophyllum or your Fucus beds, are by far the most productive seaweed ecosystems on a per area basis. So these are our kelp forests, our sargassum um, forests. They're doing the lion's share of the productivity. And these rates of productivity are really high, so they're um, comparable or higher than what you would get for terrestrial forests. And if you sort of look across the latitude, um, you can see what's interesting with seaweed productivity is that it still stays really productive at higher latitudes. Um, whereas, say, if you move into terrestrial forests, um, productivity becomes quite low when you sort of cross um, 70 degrees of latitude, whereas um, seaweeds can still be very productive in, in those cool areas. Then we're kind of in a, a boom for seaweed blue carbon research. So this is um, the number of studies that have been published on seaweed carbon sequestration uh, since 1980. And so there was a nice paper in 81 that proposed that seaweeds might be um, storing carbon and then not much really happened uh, until uh, about 2011 when this idea of blue carbon was introduced. And all of a sudden there's been a lot of excitement and work on, on better understanding uh, these ecosystems. And you can see the studies on both natural and artificial. So your artificial is gonna be your seaweed um, farms has increased quite a lot. So we're learning a lot more every year about exactly how these ecosystems are functioning. Um, and I've broken the studies into, so POC, so this is like the seaweed detritus that you can actually see. DOC is your dissolved um, seaweed uh, carbon, and then uh, your inorganic carbon. So for the most part, uh, people are studying the seaweed particles um, and, and how those um, are uh, being sequestered and cycled. And we don't know as much about the dissolved portion. And then, well, as you'll see in a sec, that's actually a pretty important um, component. And then if you look at the number of studies, what they're actually looking at, uh, most of the studies are looking at what we call fixation. So this is your productivity. How much carbon is the seaweed drawing out of the water around it and binding in biomass? That's kind of your first step to carbon uh, sequestration. There's a, less than 20 studies are actually looking at the burial of that carbon um, in the sediments. There's a few studies looking at the transport and export. And then of course, um, there's some blue carbon mapping studies that have recently come up. So um, essentially you can think of this as showing that we, we kind of understand the first part of the carbon cycle quite well, but as we sort of go into the end, um, there becomes more and more questions. Um, this is an overview of what countries have published inventories or assessments of um, their seaweed carbon. Um, so here, if we have uh, blue, there's been a regional assessment done. And if it's green, there's been a national assessment of seaweed carbon. And then um, in, in the top panel, and then the second panel, there's actually been an estimate of the standing um, stock of seaweed carbon. So you can see that Canada has, uh, first off, quite a lot of um, seaweed biomass. So Canada and Australia are actually kind of popping up there as being quite important in terms of the amount of seaweeds um, that we have and uh, and also has been ass assessed, but but mostly on a regional scale. Um, and just to highlight that um, because seaweeds aren't established as blue carbon habitats, there's a lot of debate in the literature about um, whether or not they're actually cycling carbon. Um, and 
And just to sort of sum up, I think that in general, the consensus here is that we know seaweeds are covering a lot of area. We know they're incredibly productive and they're taking in a lot of carbon. Um, but the main sort of questions in the debate are centering on the fate of that carbon. So I'm going to show a little bit what I mean here. Don't be overwhelmed by um, all the, the pathways here. I'll just uh, walk you through it. But essentially, we have in the coastal zone, you can have um, kelp or sargassum. So these would be your natural um, seaweed ecosystems or a seaweed um, farm. And uh, a portion of that production is going to follow these different pathways. So this sort of POC that I mentioned here, this is just seaweed detritus um, that can. Oh, I wonder if I can. One sec. <laughs> yeah. So this is your um, seaweed detritus that can actually leave the natural um, ecosystem. So this can leave a seaweed farm or a natural forest, and it can become burial buried in sediments or it can be transported into the deep sea. And if it reaches the deep sea, um, it can cross what we call this sequestration horizon, which I'll get into a bit later, um, and remain there for hundreds to even thousands of years. So that's effectively removing it from um, the cycle. Um, so this POC pathway is being increasingly studied, um, and it can sort of get there by tra being transported along the seafloor or by floating, um, transporting with surface currents, and then sort of sinking into these deeper areas. There's also this whole pathway that we sort of call the refractory DOC pathway. Um, so if you look at um, seaweed carbon budgets from Asia, they're often talking about this refractory DOC pathway. So essentially, a portion of the carbon um, that seaweeds are taking up, they're actually releasing it as dissolved organic carbon. And a portion of that dissolved organic carbon is what we call refractory, which means that it doesn't break down quickly. It takes you know, hundreds, even thousands of years to break down. So if that's the case, you can just figure out what the refractory proportion is, and that can just be your sequestration proportion. But the problem is, is figuring out like exactly what that uh, our DOC portion is and whether or not it changes depending on where you are sort of in the water column, uh, which is a bit of a tricky part. And then um, the the other thing that people have been talking a lot is this total alkalinity. I'm not going to get into that that much, but it's essentially um, by taking a lot of CO2 out of the water column, you're actually changing um, the, the chemistry of the water around your seaweed farm or, um, or kelp forest. And that change in water chemistry um, can be a whole other component to study and can have um, implications. Um, but the change in the water chemistry caused by seaweeds just growing is, is a seaweed carbon sink. So I'm going to get a little bit more into this one um, portion. So this is um, the lateral export of detritus um, to other systems. So this is the main pathway um, that we can sort of verify. And this is what's being currently used um, in a lot of seaweed carbon work. Uh, this picture is from Norway. It's from a fjord um, 400 meters deep, and you see a nice blade of kelp resting there. So this came just from the shallows. Um, and we really want to figure out what proportion of seaweed carbon is reaching these deep areas. Um, and we know that seaweed carbon is reaching the deep ocean. Uh, we know this from uh, water samples uh, that had seaweed DNA in them from every ocean basin down to 4,000 meters depth. We know this from sediment cores on the shelf that show that there's algal DNA um, over time accumulating. And we know this from uh, really uh, most deep sea research ever done has at some point seen uh, some, some sort of seaweed on the in the deep sea, um, either with videos or coming up with trawls. So we definitely know that this is down there. And I'm going to give you an example of how we can track uh, the export of seaweed. This was work that we did in Norway. Um, so this is the detritus production, so the um, amount of seaweed carbon that is released from the kelp forest uh, seasonally. And Norway is kind of interesting. You have this really big release in what we call the spring cast, where basically the hyperborea plants dump their old blades um, into the system. And most of the detritus is released in this flush between March and May. 
So we surveyed the surrounding area around the kelp forest during this time period, down to about 80 meters depth. So this is March when that spring cast was just beginning. Um, and all the light orange is just fragments. And you can see them. most of the seaweed fragments are between 30 and 40 meters here. Um, and they're covering about half of the seafloor. But then when we uh, went back in May, when all of this detritus was released, this is what the seafloor looked like around um, the kelp forest. So down to um, 50, 60 meters depth, there was a lot of those large seaweed fragments, which are a bit darker. Um, and they were covering, um, in some places, up to um, 50 to 70 percent of the seafloor. Uh, so you could actually track this pulse. We went back in August. It wasn't there anymore. But we went down to the deepest part of the fjord um, and there was a big spike in the amount of kelp reaching uh, 400 meters depth in this area. So all this sort of suggests that a lot of the seaweed detritus is really rapidly flushed into deep ocean. And um, we had evidence that it was entering these deep areas uh, from the genetic signatures in sediment cores. So we could see uh, amounts of red and brown algae in the fjord and in shelf sediments. Uh, we also brought the kelp up in, in trawls uh, from both regions and, of course, took the photographs that you saw. And um, these, these methods, the sort of the trawls and the photographs are kind of good anecdotal measures, but really when we're talking about verifying the export of seaweed carbon to deep regions, uh, most people are sort of going into these using genetic signatures or even biomarkers to figure out exactly how much seaweed is accumulating. So for seaweed farming, um, one of the main uh, tools people are using is they're coring the sediments directly underneath a seaweed farm and looking at the input of organic material and comparing it to nearby areas that are sort of comparable reference sites. Um, so I'm going to jump to Australia, where we've been doing a little bit more um, oceanographic work, understanding the export of seaweed carbon. Um, so Australia, all of the kelp forests are shown in blue. They're actually running along what we call the Great Southern Reef, um, which is the cold part of the continent in the south. And um, they, and I've shown the other blue carbon habitats uh, in this map as well. You can see that in terms of um, in terms of the biomass, kelp forests are sort of equivalent to the seagrass beds in the region. There's way more biomass bound in the mangroves. Um, but if you look at the, an, the annual rate of uh, sequestration, so the grams of carbon that could be sequestered by the kelp forest, it becomes quite comparable. Um, and these are just showing upper and lower bounds of our uncertainty. So this is off uh, Western Australia where I work. We have maps of the natural seaweed habitats in the region. So these dark green areas are places where we have a high probability of, of kelp. This whole area is about uh, 30 kilometers wide and it's the shelf. And then you sort of cross the shelf edge and get into uh, the Perth Canyon, which goes quite deep. And we have this feature in uh, Western Australia called a dense shelf water cascade. So here, you essentially have a buildup of really cold, dense water beside the coastal shelf um, in the in the winter months, so um, opposite to Canada. And then that dense water actually runs off the shelf. Uh, it can run at bottom currents about 0.1 to 0.3 meters per second. And we think this is a really good mechanism to export a lot of seaweed detritus into those deeper regions. Um, so. We have been working, this is work done by uh, Miriam, who's in the photo on the right, who's a postdoc um, in my team at UWA. And um, she's been uh, running these particle tracking models. So here, every black dot is a piece of seaweed detritus that's released um, on top of a seaweed uh, forest. You could do the same thing for a seaweed farm. You could release these particles just on the surface at a seaweed farm. Um, and when the particle turns green, it's actually crossed the shelf break um, and it's gone behind 600 meters depth and is entrained in those deeper areas. <laughs> and so she's running uh, this model for a few months and um, continuously adding particles into it. 
and over time, about um, if you sort of account for how how long these particles take to decompose, about 22% of the kelp produced in the shallows on the reef um, crosses uh, to uh, crosses 200 meters depth. And um, and you can see that uh, some of is actually crossing to a thousand meters. Uh, so a lot of this seaweed tray is actually ending up in these deep areas. Um, and what we could do here is if we wanted to target restoration, we could target areas that have um, really high export. Um, we could do the same. You could put the seaweed farms in areas where the currents are going offshore um, and you get a lot of export of this material. Um, so that is a, a regional example where we have high resolution current data, and that's really um, sort of the type of information we would need if we wanted to manage or estimate uh, the export of a seaweed uh, forest or seaweed farm. Um, but it's also really useful to understand how these patterns are varying globally, um, especially even if we don't necessarily have high resolution data uh, for that region. So here, um, these are, uh, this is just some work we've been doing, what we call the Euromarine um, uh, Microalgal Working Group. Um, so we've developed global models of seaweed productivity and maps of the distribution of seaweed forests. Um, and, and we're using the uh, global current models. So these are models that NOAA uh, developed that are about an eighth of a degree resolution and they run for 40 years to estimate the amount of time it takes for a water parcel in the coastal zone, either at your seaweed farm or seaweed forest, to cross the shelf break. Um, so we do this by putting in a decomposition uh, rate. So this is basically how long the seaweed is going to stay in the water column before it, something eats it or before it just decomposes. Um, and then the fraction of MPP that's actually released as seaweed detritus. Uh, I think I'm getting going too slow, so I'm going to kind of skip this a little bit. Um, but this is what our um, overall model looks like. So this is the percent of seaweed uh, primary production that exits um, into the deep sea. So I've averaged this by region. So you can actually see on the west coast of Canada, it's quite high, it's about 30%, um, even over 40% for some areas. Um, and this is due to the ocean uh, currents in the region. Um, ocean islands are really high too, <laughs> because they don't have very much shelf. And then parts of you know, the Baltic, parts of the Siberian shelf are almost zero. Um, and we can uh, multiply the net ecosystem productivity models that we made uh, with this percent export to actually figure out um, the grams of carbon, sorry, the grams of carbon that are crossing the shelf per meter squared. Um, so again, uh, you have quite high areas, in, at least on the west coast of Canada, um, parts of, of Greenland and Chile as well. <laughs> and then if you multiply this by the estimates of the area we have, we can come up with, um, with estimates. These are averaged by ecoregion of the total amount of seaweed carbon that could be sequestered every year. Um, and this ends up being globally, based on our data, about 0.1 gigatons of carbon potentially exported to the deep sea. And if we looked at this uh, nationally, um, uh, Canada comes in the top five, uh, 15 countries in the world for exported seaweed carbon. So I mentioned this like thousand year horizon um, being a carbon sequestration limit. Um, so here um, we just wanted to verify that. So essentially if the seaweed carbon crosses 200 meters or even 500 meters, how long will it take that carbon to return to the atmosphere? Um, so there's been models of what we call CO2 leakage rates. So that's basically saying, okay, if you have kelp detritus here, um, but you know, between 200 and 500 meters depth, how long in years does it take for that water body to uh, return to the surface where the CO2 can exchange again with the atmosphere? So we call that the um, sequestration time or the ventilation time. And um, here I've just shown the um, the median sequestration time scale uh, for um, for all of the seaweed carbon that's being exported. <laughs> so in general, about 50% of the seaweed carbon, if it reaches 
500 meters from that model would be sequestered for 100 years. It all, but this also depends on where you are. So if you break these time scales up by ocean realm, so in the uh, North Atlantic and the Northern Pacific, um, if it crosses 200 meters, it's probably going to reach the um, atmosphere again within 50 years, whereas if it crosses that 500 meters, um, it could take 100 to 150 years. So uh, basically, it depends on where you are, but evidence suggests that you don't necessarily need to get to the 1,000 meters. You could just get to um, 500 meters or so to be sequestered out of the carbon cycle. Okay. Um, I'm going to flip ahead of uh, these ones because I don't want to go over time. Um, but this is just basically to say that um, the climate change is actually changing um, how much seaweed carbon is being sequestered. Uh, and specifically, it uh, can potentially speed up decomposition, and then also we're losing our natural um, ecosystem. Um, but on the other side, uh, there could be places where natural uh, uh, seaweed forests are growing. So one place, one example of this is the Canadian Arctic. Um, this is from Ellesmere Island, so really high in the Canadian Arctic. You can see there's all the saccharine latissima that's beached up on shore. And this is in a place that's above any model distribution of, of seaweeds globally. So it's um, definitely being underrepresented in the Canadian Arctic. Um, and Essentially, we know that reduced sea ice, so there's less sea ice in the Arctic, it's oh, the sea ice is in gray here, and that's opening up all these coastal areas, um, providing more light, and also the temperature is warming, and all of that seems to suggest we could have an increase in seaweed um, in, in these Arctic regions, and also an increase in, in their biomass and growth. And there's just a few examples from long-term studies in green where seaweeds or seagrass have already increased in the Arctic. We sort of already are seeing this signal, but for places like Canada, we don't have um, any long-term measures of the seaweed forest. Um, so what we can do instead is use space for time uh, studies. So here, these are dive uh, sites across Nunavut and Labrador. Um, so all of these areas are places that we dove uh, with the Arctic kelp project out of Laval. And we these sort of cover a gradient of sea ice cover and uh, temperature. And here we just sampled the seaweed biomass at 5 and 15 meters. And we found that on average, even if you didn't sort of pick areas that you thought there would be seaweeds in, the average biomass in wet weight was between 4 and 6 kilograms per meter squared in some areas. This is kind of crazy amounts of, of biomass, um, you know, similar to, to sort of what you might see in a sparse macrocystis forest. And it's covering a really uh, large area of the Canadian Arctic, about 300,000 um, square kilometers. And we also found that there was a really strong negative relationship between how thick the sea ice was and how much kelp cover we found in the Arctic. So all this suggests that if we have less um, ice in the Arctic, we might actually have more seaweeds um, and more potential carbon cycling. And then finally, there was also this relationship that we found with how deep the kelps go. So depending on where you were in the Arctic, there was a strong relationship between the days without sea ice and the lower depth limit of the kelp, um, all suggesting that sea ice, sea, um, kelp forest could actually expand in the Arctic and be sort of a, an additional carbon sink up there. Um, I was recently involved in a horizon scoping paper that looked at sort of the main uh, questions remaining about uh, blue carbon for seaweed aquaculture and for wild seaweed forests. Um, so I've talked a lot about um, constraining the seaweed carbon budgets and how we might be able to do that, um, as well as some of the models and tools that we might use um, in uh, this technology. But I also just want um, to mention that we need to know a little bit more about some of the risks in terms of upscaling um, seaweed aquaculture um, and how those um, risks may, um, may offset some of the benefits. Uh, and also, uh, in both cases, there's massive policy and government challenges to actually, uh, you know, have Vera certified seaweed carbon 
uh, for example. We're not there yet um, and we're getting there, but uh, often the regulators are way behind uh, where they need to be. Um, and then I will just say that uh, a main sort of aspect for the seaweed uh, farming that is being looked at now is what the seaweed is actually being used for. Um, and that can have a really important uh, uh, implication for whether or not you can count the harvested seaweed biomass as a uh, sink. So, for example, if you're using it to make plastics, um, then you're actually taking carbon from your harvest out of the atmosphere um, for in the long term. And I'm just going to highlight this is the this is the final slide, but I'm just going to highlight some of the risks that have been associated with extending seaweed farms. So we have already there, there's already been a fair amount of research done showing that they could potentially be um, carbon sinks and they could potentially have a lot of sort of benefits in terms of improving water quality and enhancing biodiversity. Um, but these are the main risks that really um, the research community is focusing on right now and sort of understanding whether or not these are really real um, is going to be key for whether or not seaweed farming um, is considered in in sort of the range of natural climate solutions. Um, so there's been talk about the possible release of halocarbons. There needs to be more work on this. I don't think, to be honest, this is necessarily going to be the worst thing ever, um, but this is just a greenhouse gas that can come from seaweed. Um, there's also, um, let's talk about if you really scaled up the seaweed farm, um, that DOC released from the farm could have could alter the phytoplankton and bacterial communities. Um, for the most part, uh, this would just contribute to additional carbon sequestration. Um, there's uh, this uh, discussion on whether or not you get released um, methane. So we know that when seaweed decomposes, it does release methane. Um, for the most part, it, it's pretty minor because it's either a small amount of rafting on shore or it's not sort of reaching deep areas, but this could be a really big problem if your seaweed farm is in shallow water or if a lot or if sort of the seaweed farm is upscaled to the point that a lot of that material is ending up rafting on beaches. Um, and then uh, same thing if you have a really like large deposition of seaweed. So if this again, if the farm's shallow or if, uh, you know, large portions are just accumulating in the same place, you might have hypoxic areas, low oxygen. Uh, which could interact with uh, benthic communities and maybe have ecological impacts there. And then I'm just going to highlight um, this point number seven, because it's actually this is where a lot of the debate um, is happening right now and where a lot of people are talking about um, how seaweed farming might not be this, you know, silver bullet everywhere. So essentially it's and, and this basically doesn't apply to the coastal zone in a simple way. This applies to open ocean farms. Um, but much of the open ocean is limited by nutrients. So if you put a seaweed farm in the area, then you start competing with that biological pump that I mentioned um, and don't have an increase in carbon sequestration because you have no additionality. You've just taken carbon from the phytoplankton pump and put it into the seaweed carbon pump. Um, and there's even been talk about, you know, we might need to fertilize ocean areas to make them suitable for seaweed farming. This is often in the open ocean, but I think it's really um, it's really important to think about um, nutrient limitation when we start talking about how we can scale seaweed farms. With that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. So cool. thank you, Karen. That was awesome. Uh, very topical for uh, the BC area. There's we've got a couple of mm. cool kelp and uh, carbon projects coming up. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the chat box, so I'll just dig through those uh, first and then I'll open the floor to any questions that people in the meeting here might have and uh, we'll get through those. So if you use the raise your hand icon at the top there just to indicate that you might have a question, I will uh, make my way through the list of those people. But the questions in the chat here, so I can see uh, two of them right now. So uh, one of them is from Caitlin Russell. Um, her question is, do we know what portion of phytoplankton go to the ocean sediments, the timeline of when they're incorporated into the ocean sediments, and how long they remain stored there? 
<laughs> That's a really good question. I mean, the short answer is the estimates of the biological pump carbon sequestration are really like there's a wide error of margin or wide up margin of error around them. So um, we do have estimates of that. Uh, they're mostly from from models that are sort of verified with like um, sampling of the sinking rates in, in the water column. Um, but in general, it's quite small. So seaweed carbon uh, on average has about, you know, it looks like from our models uh, up to 16 percent um, could of the NPP could reach those deep sink areas. And for phytoplankton, you're talking less than 1%. So the efficiency of the transfer for seaweed is much higher um, than for phytoplankton. Cool. Uh, awesome. And Leona, I see you have your hand up and you have a question in the chat. So feel free to ask away. Yeah, thank you very much, Logan. Um, thank you, Kathy O'Karen, for the uh, presentation. I wondered if, um, because you you had mentioned that, uh, what, what did you say here? Sorry. Um, I was wondering, does multitrophic have less of implication than monoculture of seaweed as opposed to polyculture or multitrophic, like uh, cultivating other species? Um, yeah, so in general, um, when you add more species, you tend to be able to use nutrients more efficiently. Like different seaweeds would want to take up different types of nutrients. Um, so if you're incorporating um, them together, you might have like more efficient carbon uptake, if that makes sense. Because some can it like just deal with nitrate or, or some could just grow during this time if there's just a small amount of ammonia in the, the water. So so from, from that perspective, um, sure. Um, also, I think seaweed carbon is just a small tip of like a larger uh, benefits of brown seaweeds. So if you have different species, then you have you tend to have more biodiversity of associated like fish and, and things like that. So there's another benefit there for growing different seaweeds together. And then um, if you wanted to like pair seaweed farming with say oysters or, or mussel farms like polyculture, um, there's uh, th that's definitely a really good pairing because you're you're both sort of cleaning the water and those things work quite well together. So that could be a really sustainable way to produce food, um, especially if you compare it to, you know, some of the really intense practices on land or or even like massive amounts of salmon farming stuff like that. They're so intensive compared to a polyculture situation where you have you know seaweed integrated into it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's super exciting. And I remember when I first heard about it, you know, there are a lot of uh, aquaculture systems that I'm an indigenous from the Haltic Nation of Bella Bella, British Columbia. And uh, I know that, you know, my nation, along with uh, many other indigenous nations, are vehemently opposed to open net fish pens. And um, I took an aquaculture program at UBC this past fall. And I was pleasantly surprised to learn about uh, multi-trophic aquaculture. And right off mm. the hop, for me, it, it, it really is comparable to mimicking biodiversity. And I think that's that's super exciting. And, you know, I, I'm i really excited about, you know, where this goes. And I know very little about additionality, but I know that my people have Wait, uh, did not wait for the provincial government to safeguard some of our territories. And I know that, you know, um, there's uh, culturally significant areas of our territory that we've deemed um, conservancies. And we've done that about maybe five years ago. And I was talking to a gentleman about additionality and I'm wondering like holes, the land, the trees on the, on the land and, and perhaps the kelp in the water might we we might be able to claim additionality for that? Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Like if you protect your kelp forest, um, if I mean, if you if you protect a forest on land, you can actually claim the carbon because you know if that would have been logged or the carbon would have been released, your action has present prevented emissions of um, CO two 
So in the same logic can be applied to a seaweed forest, like you say. So if you protect um, a seaweed forest, or ideally if you restore it, <laughs> then, um, then you would have additionality um, there as well. So the whole, it, you, you, you've hit on a really, really interesting point. And I think there's going to be a lot of like work on this with, there's that whole 2030 um, announcement where, you know, let's protect or restore 30% of our coastal zone. And all of the countries have agreed to this. And um, it's good that you're ahead of the curve because I think most people are behind the curve a lot on that target. Um, but figuring out how that will um could potentially safeguard some of the, the carbon sinks is, is really important. Um, I, I think like one question I would just sort of pop out there is I, for, for many places, I think just drawing a line around a kelp forest and saying, don't go in it, isn't gonna help the kelp. Like if, if the water's warming or something. So we have to figure out um, how protection can actually have like meaningful, um, that there's really uh, great examples of um, indigenous people actually like, you know, taking the urchins out and like gardening the kelp and keeping it in a kelp forested state. And that would be a really good way to have additionality. That's good to know. Thank you. I have more questions, but I don't want to hog the air time here. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Leona, maybe we'll go to Tom and uh, maybe we can come back to you if you have some more questions afterwards. We have some time. Uh, so, Tom, ask away. Karen, thanks so much. That was great. Really, really informative, and comprehensive. Um, I just had a question about one of your last slides about like potential risks to uh, to scaling up the kelp farming industry. And my question is, um, you know, now that we're aware that these risks exist and this is going from area to area, how would you like to see the growing kelp industry uh, address these risks? And how would you like to see the industry proceed so that like we can meet our economic goals for the industry and have a sustainable industry, but without, you know, having these unintended side effects that, uh, you know, in 20 years, we end up realizing, oh, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. So how, how can the industry like best, best approach these potential risks and scale sustainably? I think like the industry is, I think there's two parts of the seaweed industry right now. There's like small scale farms um, that are often in like, involving coastal people they're providing um, a fair amount of benefits for the local community they are by all intents and purposes improving the the health of the waters around them these things are are pretty good in many ways it's almost like the small scale fishing great <laughs> let's let's do that um, I think where some of these risks come in is there's been there there's a a paper where they basically took the ocean, the global ocean, and they said, what area is suitable for seaweed farming? Oh, it's 20%. Let's put seaweed farms on 20% of this area and how much carbon could we draw down? And so that has like some people getting really excited and you have these super hyperscale seaweed farming initiatives happening. Like let's put wind turbines across, you know, a thousand square kilometers of coastline off Norway in the open ocean and put seaweed farms in lines all around that area. Like there's tons of whales around there. The phytoplankton is there, like that sort of hyperscale industrialization and intensification of seaweed farming is where I see all of these risks really coming. And I think that's when, whenever you sort of, if you look into the literature and you see people talk about like the, the risks of seaweed farm, they're often thinking about that. They're like, what happens if we put a seaweed farm the size of Greenland in the Atlantic? What would be the risk of that, right? Um, so I think the way to keep the to minimize those risks and to keep the industry sustainable is if we we really don't go into the open ocean yet until we know what we're doing um, and we keep it at those sort of small scale farms that we can actually have time to to figure out um, what what is happening and how sort of best to to do those practices. Great, thanks. Cool. Looks like we have another question from Chris. Hey, Karen. Hey. Really nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Well done. Um, there's been some talk about dumping of cultured macroalgae in the deep sea for deep sea carbon sequestration. What are your thoughts on that? There's, there's positives and negatives, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I guess 
my general opinion is you probably would be better harvesting that resource and using it in 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 a sustainable way that would probably be the the better way to do it um it's all scaling large scale dumping of seaweed into the deep sea when you talk to deep sea biologists they're like please don't do that <laughs> we don't we, we don't want all of your seaweed to enter the deep sea but <laughs> this is yeah. not the dumping ground um so yeah i think the intention behind these initiatives is is really good um but i also think that it would be much better if we we use that seaweed as a form of sustainable um potentially like negative carbon emission produce biomass. That would be the best solution. Um, has, yeah. has there been any calculations looking at how much CO2 you might be offsetting by diverting a certain portion of the human diet from terrestrial um, cows, pigs, poultries to seaweed? Uh, yeah, so obviously, yeah. Yeah, so this is, um, basically this is how you make the seaweed carbon budget for farming like work because if you just take the small amount of carbon that the seaweed farm is storing it's not really that much essentially all you say basically all you say at the end is we've produced this seaweed and in the production phase has been net carbon negative which is exceptional the fact that you can produce biomass and take carbon out of the atmosphere is really important but like the amount, the quantity is not going to offset your flight. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, but it's it's about what that seaweed is replacing. So if you use that seaweed to replace plastics, if you use it to um uh you know in smart aqu agriculture um or, or agriculture to replace like destructive fishing practices or to replace um you know fertilizers that have really high CO2 emissions, or if you eat that seaweed and you replace you know beef and fish. Like then um, your your emissions suddenly really start to see a difference. So um, there's been recent work, and I don't know the number offhand, but there's been recent work in Europe that are looking at like the full life cycle of the seaweed. And depending on what you use that seaweed to replace, um, it can have a really large effect on the emissions. If you do like a, it, yeah, it's not cradle to cradle. It's like, but something like that. I forget what they called it. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you very much. Cool. I think we have one more question from Daphne in the chat. And uh, oh, and there's another one popping up. Great. And then uh, Leona, I'll help facilitate a uh, connection between you two if you'd like to email. Um, I think that would be kind of cool. So uh, Daphne's question. Oh, two more. We have Daphne and Melissa. So two more questions and then uh, I think our time will be about up. Uh, Daphne's question is, what are the implications to bring bacteria while you're farming with wild seaweed? So um, um, if you need clarification, maybe Daphne can uh, ask. And yeah, no, there there was that um, th this I there was that risk factor there where like maybe you mm. could be um, harming the the micro biota or something. I mean, in general, it depends on your seed line and your hatchery. Um, for, for the most part, uh, most seaweed are grown in like pretty almost sterile conditions with really heavily filtered seawater and then they're outplanted in the field. So you don't, in, in those conditions, like not necessarily as much of an issue. Um, but uh, one of the, but, but yeah, we still, we still don't exactly know. Um, and it depends of course on the farming practice. One of the main things that there's been a lot of focus on is like the genetics of the seaweed. So let's, a really good example is Rhode Island. They're farming saccharine latissima there, but they're using latissima that's probably from colder waters. And then you actually see, um, some saccharine latissima recruits that are not really surviving the summer. They can't deal with the temperatures around Rhode Island. The same thing's happening in China where you go to the natural reef and there's like some evidence that maybe those populations just got seeded from the seaweed farms. Mm -hmm. So we, um, that's like China's an extreme case because you have a lot of seaweed farms and not really much natural seaweed. So most of them are in some ways derived from, from introductions. But, but like figuring out how you don't have, if you have a really large scale seaweed farm of say one fast growing species, how to not have that land on your natural reef and kind of mess up the genetics and maybe prevent ability to adapt to climate change or, or something 
Um, so um, trying to control that is really important when you scale. And an easy way to do it is to collect your broodstock from natural populations close to where you're going to put your seaweed farm. That's a really simple way to, to not have that happen. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, I think around here that we have uh, a 50 kilometer radius that uh, that we're collecting from. And yeah, it just yeah. helps preserve the genetic stock and the uh, kelp microbiomes that are present. Um, yeah. Cool. And uh, that's have... even conservative because I think it's 100 yeah. kilometers is recommended. So you're even doing better. So good job. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have one question from Melissa in the chat and Brent will we'll try and sneak you in there. Um, I see your hand up there. Uh, so with your, this is a question from Melissa, with your research in Australia, are you able to speak to the Australian Seaweed Institute blueprint and potential transferable opportunities for Canada? Um, I haven't spoken to the seaweed, uh, I haven't spoken to blueprint, but we do work with um, a seaweed farming company in Western Australia. And what we're doing is we're collaborating on kelp restoration. Because basically the first stage of this green gravel technique we have is a hatchery stage that you grow the kelps up on so and then you plant the rocks on the reef. So we have been working really well with the seaweed industry. And I think there's a lot of synergies between how the seaweed industry and the restoration industry can work together to both farm seaweeds and also replant the natural reefs. Uh, and in many ways, we shouldn't be restoring kelp forests from like, it shouldn't be academics going out and trying to do this. We need it to be at commercial scale levels. So why not work with the seaweed industry to get to those scales? Cool. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I kind of agree with that. It'd be cool to see little little groups of people going out to do some seaweed restoration on their weekends, you know, some citizen science. Just go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Brent, uh, I think you have a question there as well. So go ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karen. Uh, it follows up on the previous question about the CB diversion for food and kind of that um, sum together. And I'm wondering for companies and nations in BC thinking about both the profitability and kind of the endurance of blue carbon. Are you seeing any studies or can point anyone to comparing, for example, the human food use case or the asparagopsis like bovine feed use case versus like plastic substitutes and other kind of product substitutes? Is there any clear consensus or emerging research you're seeing comparing and contrasting kind of end use of grown seaweed? There, there's researchers in the Baltic that are working on this. I don't think it's published yet, but I think it's coming out where they're looking at the different um, ways that you can use seaweed. And there's also um, a UNEP report that I know is in press and might come out in like maybe this month that also looks at um, the different, um, yeah, carbon benefits from using seaweed. I think in general, like we need to have better markets for the seaweed products to be able to, to make that. Like it's, it's really great that everyone's growing seaweeds, but we have to help the entire life cycle be sustainable. So it's not just about, yeah, <laughs> go. If everyone has local scale seaweed farms, that's great. But we have to be like, yeah, we have to think all the way through the supply chain and then we can really get good benefits from that. So I think people are thinking that way and there's a little bit of research, but it's like within the last year. So it's not, not there yet, <laughs> but hopefully coming. Appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, doesn't look like we have any more questions, any more hands up or any more questions in the chat. Looks like we kind of answered everything. So that's great. But uh, yeah, thank you, Karen, once again for presenting. It was an awesome presentation and we really appreciate you taking your time to present to, uh, you know, some folks in the kelp sector over here in Canada. So thank you once again. And uh, I think that we will leave it there. As always, guys, the uh, presentation is recorded, so it will be up online on the North Island College page. So if you would like to review anything or you know anyone that's missed anything um, or missed the meeting and wants to view it, uh, I can send the link or you guys can look up the North Island College projects page and see the seaweed seminar to be hosted up there in about a week or so, so look out for that. But yeah, thank you guys and enjoy the rest of your days. Yeah. Thank you. Cool, thanks, see you later.